I was talking to my name yesterday in my comment section about what constitutes or what, sorry, what are the implications, I think, of hard determinism. Um, and I said that I, I don't so much think that determinism is wrong. I'm not trying to refute determinism. What I'm trying to say is that it may be an incomplete explanation of reality, I guess. It doesn't seem to tell the whole story. Um, and one of the interesting things is this idea of reality operating on different levels. Now, um, if you look at, say, the issue of identity, um, that could mean several things, but I mean identity in two senses. Identity as in the um, one of the three cardinal rules of classical logic, identity, A is A, and identity, i.e., um, not so much an I, but that which perceives, that which has experiences, that which is on the receiving end of qualia. Um, those two permutations on identity. Um, <clears throat> As I keep saying about, you know, when I point to this room behind me being nothing more than matter, energy, and empty space that is just part of the massive causal thingy, whatever you want to call it, that just keeps reforming and reshaping itself ad infinitum? I don't know. Um, it's just that which is. I guess that's where the Eastern or Hindu term um, prakriti comes from matter, I guess, or the physical universe or whatever, what, you know, it's as though it's just a thing. Um, crudely put, I guess we could call it the wheel of existence, um, that we are somehow stuck to. Um, because that's all that it seems to be. Um, Heraclitus again. If you look at, say, hard determinism from a Heraclitan point of view, there is nothing but flux. There is nothing but change. Nothing is ever coherent long enough to be definitively called a thing. Thingness. Thingness requires something external to reality to place identity upon it. Because whatever thing you care to come up with at one point was not, and at, some, at another point is, and at another point <clears throat> is not again. For example, the atoms in my body um, may have once belonged to, uh, I don't know, an asteroid in the far reaches of the <laughs> known universe and are now configured together in my body. Or what was that the, that sort of neat little uh, probability exercise, which I'd, I've never really see, seen it investigated, but it's an interesting little thought thingy where they say, okay, exhale, there, now... It's mathematical certainty, says this little saw, that um, one, of, one of the molecules that I just exhaled was guaranteed to have been one of the molecules that Julius Caesar exhaled with his dying breath. <laughs> it sort of tells you the interconnectedness of everything, and I don't know if that really pans out. I've never actually attempted to analyze that, but it, it gives you some ideas to the interconnectedness of everything, and the the, <clears throat> I won't say the finitude of the universe, but the totality, the totalness of the universe. Because um, all that I see around me, I see a city, you know, if I do this, I see a city through this window, and all that that is is matter, energy, and empty space that has been sort of, as it were, rehashed since the Big Bang. Um, into different forms, different things. At one point, it was all, I guess, just prairie mud or, uh, you know, a lot of the rocks and the bricks and everything was just stuff that somebody, you know, mined out of the ground, turned into these building materials, built buildings over a period of time. These buildings will deteriorate, collapse back into the mud. And, you know, you can say that about absolutely everything. <clears throat> 
So at one point, what, what point in this process does a thing actually exist as a thing? Does a thing have an identity? Is, is something itself? At what point? How do, you, how do you decide that? It's completely arbitrary. You need something to, that's outside of it all to say, or not outside of it all, but perhaps an adjunct to it all or something to say, A is A. Um, if you didn't need to actually do that, then we wouldn't have the three uh, classic rules of logic. We wouldn't need to have them. It, it, identity would be an absolute. It isn't. <laughs> That's why we have to have that, as I call it, our Western logic version of the Shahada. You have to have a point at which to start, <laughs> and identity is one of them. And you have to just say, A is A. End of story. <clears throat> Well, that's nice. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't mean A is A any more than the Shahada means that there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. It's just, you know, you, you just say that and that's that. Um, you're planting your flag in the ground. You're dropping your anchor. Zapfi, eh? Identity is, in my opinion, nothing more than one of Zapfi's anchors. Um, <clears throat> and... What does that do, say, to things like a system? What does that do to, say, the causal chain? It's not even a chain anymore, because a chain requires links, different things in it. It's sort of just the blob. It's not even a chain. It's not even in anything. It's just, as I say, flux. Um, not even a flux of things. Just flux. <laughs> End of story. Um, <clears throat> which really, you know, I, so <laughs> like that doesn't really, it doesn't seem to change anything because what I see around me seems perishingly real, you know, uh, but uh, that's to me, it seems real. <laughs> Think about that. Eh? Whatever reality all this has is something that I have imposed upon it, which brings me to the other sort of branch of identity. Um, maybe I don't exist as an I, okay, uh, whatever, but something is perceiving all of this and something is seeing identity where identity is not actually there. Now, at the same time as I can say that maybe identity isn't there, something in me says, yes, it bloody is. <laughs> You're standing on the seventh floor of an apartment, of, of an office tower, you're looking out over a large and complex city. Well, it's not large by world standards, but, you know, big enough, a million people in it. Um, <clears throat> so, in some ways, this city does exist. In some ways, it doesn't. In some ways, it's just part of the blob of existence itself. Um, I guess that's what uh, Rocantin called it when he was referring to existence. It's just this bleh that's attached to us in some sense. Um, or the Jains would say it's, uh, it's ajiva, which is the non-consciousness stuff. Um, it's the, it's prakriti, it's, it's phenomenality, it's that which is not me, but, you know, it's the wheel of existence, I guess. It's just the physical universe and <clears throat> I think that in the western sense it's easier for us to think of saying you know, nausea Rocantin sort of saying that he's nauseated by existence itself because it's everywhere um, but something has to actually perceive all of this even for the nausea to exist um Something has to perceive all of this for things like suffering to exist, or existential joy, or fear, or whatever. Something is placing value on this. Desire. Desire is actually, you know, what generally is held in the Eastern traditions to be at the absolute base of everything. I look out into the skyline that I see in front of me and I see a bunch of buildings. Why? Because I want to see what the buildings that are there. A lot of people, when they're sort of trying to illustrate the moment of becoming, they say it's so chaotic that we deliberately arrange everything into these forms in our own minds uh, in order to make sense out of it, to avoid the absolute <clears throat> I don't know, chaos and terror of the moment of becoming. Zapfi again. Um... 
And, you know, it's an interesting question. What would Zopfi make of identity? I think he would say it's one of one of our anchors. Um, because if, you know, if we didn't have that anchor, then we would see reality in, a, in all its insanity, and we would go mad like Zapfi's caveman did in The Last Messiah. Um, but again, something has to be perceiving all of this in order for there to even be the moment of chaos. Because even chaos itself is an imposition. Even chaos assumes non-chaos, which assumes order and structure and form, which don't phenomenally exist, which are, again, impositions by us onto it. Um, whatever us is and whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that identity doesn't exist. I'm just saying in some ways identity exists and in some ways it doesn't. In some ways the I exists and in other ways it doesn't. <clears throat> um, I'm not talking about panpsychism or anything like that. I'm just saying that I'm not certain that we really know what, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what consciousness is or what perception is or what qualia, qualia are. And we don't really know what, again, all of this, that which is existence itself, is. But we impose order upon it. Um, Heraclitus is often called the sad philosopher, but I don't see that as sad at all. In fact, in a strange kind of way, I find it very liberating. It's like the world is what you make of it, or what that which perceives it makes of it. Um, <clears throat> I don't see the non-existence or potential non-existence of identity as a source of confusion or fear or existential horror the way Zafi seems to. Um, I sort of go, oh, wow, <laughs> isn't that neat? You know, um, I'm just discovering that everything that I thought was true is questionable. Everything. Even the idea of truth itself becomes kind of questionable. And again, this isn't... This isn't some way of saying that everything is, you know, a complete blur and a void and a nothing. Because there's something in all of this that seeks to impose order upon all of this and seeks to sort of build, as I say, the sandcastles out of the sand that is just endless, not even causality, just endless existence. Um, existence is just all of matter, energy, and space rehashing itself into different forms ad infinitum forever. But something wants to impose something on that, some sort of order, some sort of sanity, some sort of um, pattern or whatever. That can only be done external to that which does not contain patterns. In fact, the whole idea of patternness is something we impose on reality itself. That's an interesting metaphysics, but it's certainly not my own. My, I didn't originate the idea. Um, it's as old as it gets. <clears throat> It's interesting that we inevitably start talking about things like suffering, because that's you know that's that, that was the endless philosophical argument that took place in ancient India. What do we do about suffering, and what are the implications of suffering? You know, that's Buddhism and Jainism. Right? The the argument, or Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism, the sort of tripartite arguments that they all had about that subject, suffering and our seeming unending desire to overcome. It to overcome suffering and to reach out to that which is suffering's exact opposite. What you see in terms of existence doesn't seem to have any value. But not only does something place value on it, something wants to place value on it, positive or negative. <laughs>